Praise God. Uh, I certainly pray uh, that you all are able to see the love of God as he laid down his son for us and uh, just how uh, that song, that, that line, God laying his son down for us has all the more meaning for me as uh, we have our own son and uh, just can't imagine uh, the love that God has for each and every one of us. And it's my prayer uh, that you all can see the love that God has for you as he laid down his only begotten son for you. So that he could have an everlasting relationship with you. What a good, good God that we serve. And I noticed I forgot my Bible. Mackenzie, would you hand me my Bible? I'm slacking. Uh, pastor should never forget his Bible. That's a bad sign there. Thank you. Thank you to my lovely baby sister. You never guess, and she's a six foot giant, but yes, my baby sister. Uh, but what a fun day we had yesterday at the Easter egg hunt. Um, Ezra got in on the fun as well. He got to pick some Easter eggs. So, well, I say Easter eggs, but really he picked an Easter egg. Uh, my son was more fascinated with uh, the rocks next to the toddler area than the hundreds of bright, colorful, candy-filled eggs. So sweet, sweet Maylee, uh, she picked some Easter eggs uh, for him. And when we got home... He's like, wow, these are pretty, gay, pretty great. So thank you, Maylee, again, uh, for picking some eggs for uh, my doofus son, Ezra. Only my son uh, would find the rocks more entertaining than the hundreds of colorful, candy-filled eggs. Uh, and yesterday at the Easter egg, I also was able to see a couple of uh, my soccer girls there. You guys, a lot of you guys know I'm uh, coach soccer in the falls uh, with the Northwestern uh, youth program there, and I got to see a couple of them. I didn't want to embarrass her, but I saw one of them uh, this morning as well that came, uh, and that just brightens uh, my day. So thank you, Baker family and Hackathorn family, uh, for bringing on the soccer girls uh, to church. Uh, so that is great. Um, so who loves movies? Who, who likes to watch movies? Raise your hand. Yes, uh, Jamie and I, uh, we don't have a ton of similar interests. Um, I'm into like the sports thing. She's into um, artsy, crafty stuff. I don't know, girl stuff. I'm into boy stuff. But we both like movies. We both sit down and we both enjoy a good movie. And, and I love a good plot twist. You know, when you're watching a movie and it's going down one direction, but all of a sudden the movie turns in a, in a dramatic turn of events, and I love that. That's what gets me wanting more. How many Marvel fans in here? Raise your hand if you're a Marvel fan. Yes, I am a huge Marvel fan. Like, those are my favorite movies. Um, and in uh, the movie Infinity War, spoiler alert if you've not seen Infinity War, um, but when Thanos snaps his finger, the, the main antagonist, he snaps his finger and and half of the world population vanishes. I mean, that was a dramatic turn of events. That, that was an extreme plot twist where all of a sudden we have all these good guys, these heroes, and all of a sudden the bad guy snaps his finger and half of the world vanishes into thin air. This is probably uh, the most memorable plot twist uh, for me in movies as I saw this one in theaters, I believe, on opening night. And I just like Marvel movies so much. And I remember Peter Parker, a.k.a. Spider-Man, he says uh, to Tony Stark, who's Iron Man, he says, Mr. Stark, I don't feel so good. And then he vanishes into thin air right in front of Tony Stark. And I'm like bawling here and uh, just such a, a dramatic turn of events or arguably the, the most well-known plot twist in all movies of all history is Star Wars in, in, in episode five where Darth Vader, the main antagonist, tells Luke Skywalker, the protagonist, he says... I am your father. And you're like, what? And it wasn't really a surprise to my generation because we had our parents telling us that, hey, Vader is Luke's father. Like, thanks for that spoiler alert. Um, but uh, in the previous generation, how many of you guys saw that episode in theaters? And you, you were like, what? Vader is Luke's father? Yeah, a handful of you guys. I would have loved to have seen that. That's arguably the greatest plot twist in all of movies as the, the main villain of the series. He's the father 
of the main good guy, and it just blows your mind. And so movies, they, they try to find these great plot twists, and it's what makes us coming back for more. It makes the, the, these kind of events unpredictable, and, and, and we love a, a good dramatic sequence of events, a good dramatic turn of events. And, and so many movies do a, a wonderful job in capturing the, these great plot twists and dramatic turn of events. But today through next Sunday, we are going to take a look at the single most dramatic and greatest turn of events in all of history. I, I mean, the, the, this is the, the, the sort of event, this is the sort of plot twist that movies try to capture. But here in the Bible, we have the greatest plot twist. We, we have the greatest, most dramatic turn of events in all of human history. And today we're, we're going to take a look at the story. We're, we're get, really going to take a look at the story today and on Friday and on Sunday as well. And they all tie together. So if you're here with us this morning, I hope you're able uh, to come back on Friday and Sunday as we continue the story and, and, and just the dramatic turn of events that takes place in the story, starting with, does anybody know what today is? Palm Sunday, yes, this dramatic turn of events starts with Palm Sunday. We, we have our palm leaves down here in the aisle to represent uh, the palm leaves. Um, but when you take a look at your calendar each year, uh, whether you're young and hip and have a calendar on your phone, or if you're more traditional, have your calendar at home, um, you'll see that each year, Palm Sunday falls the Sunday before Easter. And Palm Sunday, in a nutshell, if you have no idea what Palm Sunday is, in a nutshell, it's where Jesus triumphantly enters the city of Jerusalem. That's Palm Sunday. That, 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 that's how we can uh, summarize it. And just one sentence is where Jesus triumphantly enters the city of Jerusalem. But, but, but today, we're not just going to stick with that summary. We're going to dive deep into the story of Palm Sunday. And we're going to see how this sets us up for the greatest, the most dramatic turn of events in all of history. So if you have your Bibles this morning, you can open up to the book of Matthew, where the words will be projected behind us. But in Matthew chapter 21, we will read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. So in Matthew chapter 21, uh, we read about Palm Sunday, or, or my, uh, in my translation, the ESV, uh, they have these different subtitles. They subtitle this, The Triumphal Entry, as again, Palm Sunday is all about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. So without me spoiling too much, where we'll go ahead and read it uh, for ourselves. In Matthew chapter 21, starting with verse 1, it reads, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. They, they, they say they, the they that they're talking about is Jesus and his disciples. So Jesus sends two disciples saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So we'll go ahead and stop there for a second. So a couple of things that we need to take a look at here. First things first is we need to understand that Jesus, he's entering the city of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem at this time was under the jurisdiction of the Roman Empire, arguably the, the strongest empire of all of history. So J Jerusalem's under the jurisdiction of the Roman Empire, but Jerusalem basically served as the capital city of the Jews. Um, and, and so Jesus, he's entering the capital city of his people, the Jews. And the interesting thing about Jerusalem is Jesus knew a particular event was going to take place to him in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus knew, as he was getting ready to enter the city of Jerusalem, Jesus knew that he was going to die. 
He knew that he was going to die in the city of Jerusalem. We can read this in Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. This is the third time that Jesus uh, predicts his death, where he takes his disciples aside secretly, privately, and he's talking to his disciples. The other two instances are found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, and Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. And and all three instances, it's just between Jesus and his disciples. And, And I can imagine the intimate moment uh, that Jesus is here uh, having with his disciples. And in this third instance, in in chapter 20, verse 17, and Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples inside, and on the way, he said to them, see, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. And so I can just imagine the, the, the somber moment that Jesus is having with his disciples in, in a previous instance when Jesus shares this information with his disciples. Peter, arguably his closest disciple, says, far be it uh, from you, Lord. That, that shouldn't happen. That's where you, you may know the line where Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. When, when he's talking directly to Peter, says, get behind me, uh, Satan, uh, for Peter had uh, the, the focus of man, but he needed to focus on God. Um, but here, man, uh, I, I can't imagine. I think of uh, with uh, my grandfather when he uh, came over to our house, I remember one day, and uh, he told us that he had cancer. Um, he defeated cancer once, but I mean, when, whenever someone um, uh, has cancer, this, this particular case of cancer uh, wasn't um, a, a a very positive form. It, was, it wasn't good news at all. And uh, just uh, the, the somber moment uh, when, when we all have experiences uh, like that, when, when someone tells you that, hey, um, my end may be coming, um, it, it, it's sad. And Jesus here, if, if you took note in verse 18, he says, see, you are going up to Jerusalem. And and Jesus knew that this was going to take place in Jerusalem. Jesus knew that he was going to be mocked in Jerusalem. Jesus knew that he was going to be flogged or scourged in Jerusalem. And Jesus knew that he was going to be crucified in Jerusalem. And Jesus yet, he still triumphantly entered the city of Jerusalem. I don't know about you, but, but if God revealed to me that if I were to enter into the city of Jerusalem, my first instinct was to be, would be to run as far away from Jerusalem as possible. Because I, I wouldn't want to go through the mocking, I wouldn't want to go through the flogging, and I wouldn't go through the crucifixion. But Jesus, he triumphantly entered the city of Jerusalem. And we're going to talk about that more in a bit. But Jesus, this mode of transportation that he chooses to enter uh, the city of Jerusalem is a colt or a donkey. As it says, uh, as Jesus instructs two of his disciples, go into a village and you'll find a donkey and a colt with it and bring it to me. And then uh, Mark and Luke, they, they refer uh, to this incident and, and they uh, clearly signify that uh, this colt has never been ridden on. So Jesus is about to ride on a colt that has never been ridden on and, and he's going to enter the city of Jerusalem with it. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about kings or, or, or uh, majestic people entering into a town or a village back in the day, I imagine them riding a big white majestic horse. I mean, that's how all of the movies portrays the, the, the kings riding into a city. But Jesus chose a colt or, or, or a donkey, however you uh, uh, read that there. But, but he chose a colt to ride on, basically a, a baby donkey there to ride on that's never been ridden on. But he chose a cult for a very specific reason. Because in verse 4 it says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. 
So here, this is recorded, this is taken directly from uh, the book Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Ben, if you you have that verse uh, behind me, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, I just want you guys to see it uh, with your own eyes. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation, as he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the full of, uh, of a donkey. And so here's Zechariah, if you didn't know, Zechariah was written about 500 years before Jesus ever lived. So about 500 years before Jesus ever lived, the prophet Zechariah said, behold, Jerusalem, your king, he's going to come to you riding on a donkey on a colt. He's going to come riding to you on this colt. To you, O Jerusalem, righteous and having salvation is he. And so Jesus, went, when he chose the, this cult as a mode of transportation, he was declaring to the people without explicitly saying, he was declaring that, hey, I am your king. I am your king. I am righteous. I have salvation. And I am humble. Humble uh, as a donkey is certainly more of a humble mode of transportation than a horse. But Jesus, he's letting the people know that, hey, I am the king. I'm the king that you have been waiting so long to see. The king that all the way back in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, records specifically that this king would ride on a colt into the city of Jerusalem. I mean, for me personally, the greatest proof that our Bible is true is that things written hundreds and hundreds of years before take place exactly to how it is written. I mean, there, there's no other way to explain it than, than that Zechariah had some sort of divine interpretation, or he had some sort of, uh, of divine insight. And we would say that, yes, it was inspired by God. As this word, the, the, the God's word, the Bible, is inspired by God. And for me personally, that's the greatest proof that we have that what we see here, it's true. Because 500 years before Jesus lived, A prophet named Zechariah said that a king would ride on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem. And you guess it, 500 years later, that is exactly to a T what Jesus did here in Matthew chapter 21. So Jesus, he's triumphantly entering into the city in which he's about to die. And he chose to, his mode of transportation is a colt. And so we continue in verse 6 of chapter 21. And it reads, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowd that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So Jesus, he he has his donkey ready and he goes and he triumphantly enters the city of Jerusalem. And there's a great crowd there as they recognize, they know the scriptures. They know that, hey, he's signifying that he is the king. He's the king of the Jews. And so a big crowd gathers and this big crowd, they lay down their cloaks on the road. They, they lay down palm branches. And the palm branches, uh, they're special because palm branches back in the day, they were a symbol of victory. So when the crowds, when they laid down the palm branches before Jesus and his disciples, they were signifying that victory has come as their king, the long-awaited Messiah, is entering the city of Jerusalem. We have victory. And the crowds had his back. The crowds were ecstatic to have King Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem. And they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Now, Hosanna is an interesting word because Palm Sunday, the the story of Palm Sunday in the Bible is the only incidence where the word Hosanna is found. 
And many people uh, refer to Hosanna as meaning an exclamation of praise. And no doubt the Jews, they were exclaiming praise to Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. If, if you Google the word Hosanna, that, that's likely the definition that you're going to come upon is, is, is an exclamation of praise. However, a lot of scholars believe that the original intent of the word Hosanna was to mean save or save now. I believe we talked about this a, a couple of years ago. Um, but so, so the, the Jews, the crowd, when they were laying down their palm branches signifying victory was here, they were laying down their, their cloaks, humbling themselves before Jesus, and they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest. It was a plea to Jesus to save them. Save us, Jesus. Victory has come. Save us now as they were living under the harsh Roman rule. And they thought that God's Messiah was coming to save them from that harsh Roman rule. And not only did, did, did they, they signify victory by the palm branches or, or um, they, they just gathered in the first, pray, in the first place and, and singing praise to Jesus, but they called him, they defined him as the son of David. The son of David. And that is so important because in the book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, we can read the Davidic covenant. If you've not read the Davidic covenant, I'd strongly encourage you to do so. We won't do it today uh, for time's sake. But within this Davidic covenant, a covenant that God establishes with King David, God tells King David that, listen, one day your son, your offspring, is going to establish your throne forever. And he's going to establish his kingdom forever. And so the crowds, as they were shouting Hosanna to the son of David, they were saying that, hey, the king has come. Our king has come. And he is going to establish God's throne forever. He's going to establish God's kingdom forever. I mean, the crowds could not have been more excited to see Jesus. As Jesus, he was triumphantly entering the city of Jerusalem, riding on a colt, the crowds laying down their cloaks, laying down the palm branches, shouting, Hosanna, save us, Jesus. You are the son of David. You are the king. You are the Messiah that we have been waiting for thousands and thousands of, of years. And so just in this story in Matthew chapter 21, we get a great sense of celebration, a great sense of victory. But unfortunately, that's how we're going to conclude this story uh, today with Palm Sunday. We conclude this story. We're on a very high note. The king has come. They think victory is coming. As Jesus, he is triumphantly entering the city of Jerusalem. But we're going to end a bit on a cliffhanger today. As on Friday and Sunday, we're going to continue this story, and we're going to see how this serves as a dramatic turn of events, the single greatest dramatic turn of events in all of history. Before uh, we, we conclude today, I, I want to uh, re-highlight the point where Jesus knew that he was going to die. As again, in Matthew chapter 20, when, when Jesus brings his disciples uh, aside privately, he tells them, guys, listen up. We're about to enter the city of Jerusalem. I got to tell you something. In this city, I am going to be mocked, I'm going to be flogged, and I'm going to be crucified. And so Jesus had this awareness. Jesus had this revelation from God. And Jesus, with this information, Jesus had three choices. There's only three choices that Jesus had at this time. One, he could run away from Jerusalem. Again, this is what I would do. This is what I imagine most of us would do. If we knew that when we enter Jerusalem, all these bad things were going to happen to us, I'm guessing most of you, like me, we would run as far away from Jerusalem as possible. So that's option number one. Option number two, Jesus, he could have secretly entered the city of Jerusalem. You know, he, he, he could have slipped behind uh, the, the walls of the city. He could have uh, put a hood on or, or a cloak to disguise himself. But uh, Jesus, he didn't choose that option either. Jesus chose the third option in which he triumphantly entered the city. 
Jesus stared death down and he triumphantly entered the city in which he knew that he was going to be crucified. He did not run away. He did not cower. He boldly and triumphantly entered that city. That is your savior. If that doesn't pump you up, I don't know what will because Jesus, he triumphantly entered the city in which he was going to die because Jesus is the light of the world. He was no longer hiding his true identity. When we read through uh, the, the different gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see that Jesus, when he performs a miracle early on in his ministry, he tells the, the people in whom he performed these miracles to, he says, hey, keep it on, keep it on the down low that, that I am the Messiah, that, that I have these powers, because he knew his time had not yet come to die. But at this point in time, there was a change in how he approached it, and he proudly, he boldly, and triumphantly declared that, hey, I am the king of Israel. I am the king of the Jews, and I am bringing victory. I am bringing victory, and I will save you. And that's, again, how we end the story today on a bit of a cliffhanger. And when you watch all those TV shows, they always end on a cliffhanger. That's because they want you to come back for more. And won't we, we want you guys to come back for more because Jesus, he's riding on, on uh, an emotional high, I'm sure. The crowds are running on an emotional high, but it's not going to end like that because, spoiler alert, there will be a huge turn of events. And when we take a look at Jesus and how he approached uh, the entrance into the city of Jerusalem. We we can take a valuable lesson from this. As we, Jesus had an identity as the king, as the son of God, but we have an identity as children of God. And just like Jesus had uh, one of three options as he entered Jerusalem, we have one of three options in how we approach our identity as children of God. One, we can run away. We can run away from our identity as children of God. We can run away. We can seek to live a life of sin and take, it, take in the pleasures uh, of all that the sinful world has to offer. So that's our first option. We can run away from our true identity as children of God. Option number two is we can secretly live a life as a child of God. And I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed to admit that this was my life in high school. Um, As I uh, constantly, five days a week, I was surrounded by people who didn't have the same faith in me, who didn't have uh, the the same priorities in me. And even though I identify myself as a child of God, I hid that. I was embarrassed. I was shy. And I secretly lived my life as a child of God. And again, I am embarrassed of that. I regret that. I'm ashamed of that to this day. But that's option number two. We can secretly live a life as a child of God. But option number three, the best option that's available to us today, is that we can boldly and triumphantly live our lives as children of God. This is the obvious choice. The obvious choice in which we should mimic the attitude of Jesus. As amidst everything that he was encountering in his life, he chose to triumphantly enter that city with boldness and courage. And that that doesn't mean that that we need to live our lives bragging and maintaining an arrogant character, character. But what that does mean is that we need to stick out like a sore thumb. We need to be the light of the world. As society is living in a world of sin, they, they, they are practicers, practicers of sinners, and, and we need to stick out like a sore thumb. We need to let them know that we don't partake in the sins of the world, that we partake in loving our enemies. We partake in loving God and loving people, that we partake in praying to the creator of the heavens and the earth. We need to let them know that, that we are reading our Bibles and we need to be a light to the world. Just like Jesus was, as again, he triumphantly entered the city of Jerusalem. Your Savior did not back down from the opportunity before him. And the pressure's on us now. We cannot back down from this occasion. We have to rise to the occasion, boldly and triumphantly live our lives as children of God just like our Savior, just like our King Jesus did as he boldly and triumphantly entered the city of Jerusalem. Let's pray. 
Father God, I thank you for this day. Father, I pray that we today, we can mimic uh, the attitude of your son as he triumphantly entered that city. Father, I pray that you give us that boldness, that courage to stick out like a sore thumb, to be the light of the world, to show the world your love, the love of your son, as you lay down your son for us. Father, we cannot thank you enough for that. Father, we look forward to remembering the crucifixion of your son and the resurrection of your son as well. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. It's such-